Hello everyone, uh, my name is Donatas Urbanas, I'm the host of Basket News Talks and this time uh, we have Jargris Kovnas head coach, Martin Schiller. Hello coach. Basketnews.com, you guys are good. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best beginning of the Basket News Talks Here we, go. we already had. See, 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 see. And we are, we are here in a Gloria Sports Arena and what is fascinating about this place is that four teams are here they live here for almost a week and for me as a you know basketball lover it's fascinating to share the same corridors with uh, head coach like martin schiller with Ergin Ataman, with all these assistant coaches players nba scouts are, uh, are here and uh, i was just thinking you know you probably also had so many conversations during your stay in in, in gloria uh, did you have any talk with Ergin Ataman, for example uh, no, not yet, uh, but uh, had good talk to a uh, coach for Loco, right, obviously. For shooting, right? Yes, exactly. And uh, uh, Tolgo Ungern, he's the GM for Tofash, mm. uh, long conversation. So you're absolutely right. The setup uh, <coughs> kind of invites conversations, right? Okay, so then if Ergin Atman, uh, I'm taking him uh, as an example because he's the yearly coach of the year, he's the yearly champion. If Ergin was sitting in this room in my place and you would have that half an hour we, we have already, what would you ask him? What you would like to know about him, about his approach, about FS? Uh, I would talk, I would for sure ask him about uh, technical basketball things, uh, less, less philosophical things, but more about technical and tactical things. Because uh, if you get that kind of opportunity, I feel one should use it, you know. Did you talk about any, you know, tactical things during the summer? Uh, because I understand it was a busy summer, you know, you changed half of Radigris roster. You had to take some rest after your rookie experience. You have to spend some time with uh, family. But how coach usually develops during the summer? Did you have that kind of conversations? Like, for example, you had the uh, Ettore Messina after a game in Milano. Did you plan any interviews? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, it's, it's part of it. And one has to really take care that in the short summer, it doesn't get lost in the recruiting. You know, I, I think that's really very important that the basketball part doesn't get lost. It's the essential part, right? But uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, you've got to like recruit a team as well. So... To answer your question, yes, uh, but also to answer your question, my experience has always been that one has to also harp on it, like one has to take time for it because often it goes under and uh, it gets lost in mm -hmm. recruiting. And Paulus uh, Matunas gave an interview uh, during preseason and he told that he had a, a good time, you know, talking to you about basketball, even your during your holiday, uh, I would say, when you were in Mallorca, if, if, if I'm correct. And he told that, you know, one phone call could last for an uh, hour and a half and stuff like that. And probably you made some signings, you know, during your time off. What do you remember about the strangest situations where you had, you know, to have these interviews, signings or some important uh, stuff to discuss? Um, probably the we went to Germany also. We went to Spain quickly after the season and then we came back uh, to be here for the Olympic qualifiers and then um, spent 10 days in Konas, which was really nice. And then uh, went by car to Germany, actually. To, so it was 13 hours. And we slept in Warsaw uh, for a night. And like we were like, it was hot. And there was a, one room with four of us. And there was conversations with agents about like a deal that didn't happen at the end. Um, but it was uh, 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 like a thing that came down to the wire between two teams and it was like time pressure on the table and there was like those situations in the summer always happen that on weird spots you know the family was sleeping and i was trying to whisper in the phone and texting and uh, totally in transition of driving a car for 13 hours so those things happen you know mm -hmm. uh, take us to that room uh, to the office of polus matunas uh, when you guys just sit down and try to you know to make the plan of the rebuilding you, you bring seven new players, that's, that's a huge change compared to the last season. What was your idea, you know, sitting uh, uh, down and, you know, making all these plans? Mm. Um, our idea was, uh, our idea was, I want to say it differently. Um, 
the recruiting summer always has its own stories in a way um, and its own history, right? Like, hey, the one piece comes and then the next piece fits and then, oh, this didn't work out, so now it's that. You know, I, I um, um, you're always in between being done with the team a month earlier or uh, something falls through and, and now it takes all the way till the end. So those are kind of the stories that happen, right? I think with us, the main thing is always, it starts with the Lithuanians, right? Looking which Lithuanians are out there who can play on this level. And uh, that combination, who's out there who can play on that level and is actually without a contract. That's the first thing. And um, obviously the summer started with uh, with the fight over Rokas, right? And uh, and then it kind of you know went along, and then from knowing which Lithuanians are available, um, um, the story continues. Talking about Rokas, how upset you were about his decision? You helped a lot, uh, you know him, letting him play so many minutes, getting that uh, huge experience in the Euroleague. What kind of plans you have, uh, you know, uh, for him for the next uh, season? What was the main idea of your uh, pitch? Um, so, so first of all, I'm not upset at all. Uh, like, you know, everybody's got to um, she get an offer from from FC Barcelona. That's a great thing, right? Like, I, I think that's one thing that our club also and like we kind of I'm proud of. You know, Nigel Hayes, FC Barcelona, Krigonis, uh, Cheska, Moscow, Joko Baitis, FC Barcelona. Tom walk up Olympia cost, like all massive moves up financially, all moves up status wise, you know, and that's quality of our club too. And I feel it's a quality of our work as well, you know, that um, we put them on a plateau and made them better and they, we played well as a team and that's part of the story and that's part of who we are, right? That's how we identify. So I'm not, I'm not mad or uh, I'm not mad, also not upset. Would I have loved to have kept Rokas for sure, hundred percent. Also thought we were in the run, to be honest. Like I, this is not against Rokas by no means. I just thought the fact that he was playing so much time guaranteed, um, uh, and you know, was was something that uh, gave us chances to keep him. You know, but okay, it didn't work out. That's part of the story. My next question will be connected to the idea of you know rebuilding the team about the you know approach on the summer market and it's also connected uh, to the promotion of our EuroLeague uh, fantasy and it's a tricky question but if EuroLeague and your team building your team will be uh, based on like NBA draft system you can imagine that you don't have any players on Jalgeris and you're just building the team from the stretch and you have a number one overall pick in the EuroLeague with the current uh, market who would be your number one overall pick? <laughs> You guys are funny. Do you ask everybody this question? Yes, yes. Oh. Ergin Ataman told that uh, besides his players, mm -hmm. Nikola Mirotic would be his number okay. one. Okay. I'm not going to say one of my players, right? Because otherwise yeah. it's like, yeah. it's not fun, right? Uh, Nikola Meli. Okay. Why? Because I always loved him. Uh, I always, from his Bamberg days, I thought he was a fantastic player. Um, uh, and um, I think he's a, He's a four who can actually play the five in the modern game as well, and just a good player. It was interesting that it was a shame that it didn't really work out in the NBA. It's you know it's got to be a fit, and if it doesn't fit, and if if the use isn't there for players like him, then it doesn't work out, and then it doesn't make any sense. And there's also no disrespect to anybody, or it's just like you know those guys need fits, right? Those guys need situations where they can pick and pop and stretch the floor. And I always liked them a lot. I'm asking this question because I try to imagine what is the found base for you, you know, of the rebuild? Where do you want to, you know, from where do you want to start building your team? What is the most, most important piece which you want to, you know, start from? Um, for, for me, it's important to have uh, some shooting at the four, you know, that's, that's important to keep the floor space. So. Um, you know, that's the idea behind uh, Tyler, 
and also behind Neil, so can shift from the three to the four, uh, especially with Yankee, uh, you know, getting older and, uh, and, and, you know, like getting older and buying him some time and minutes. Um, so that, that was a kind of an important piece. And one of the most important pieces was Emmanuel Moldier, obviously the biggest name, uh, even in the, this EuroLeague uh, summer market. When you were informed that he was available, uh, what was your first thought? Did you believe that you can convince him, of course, because of your connection in, in, in Utah? Uh, did you believe that it might be real that he's coming to Colmas? Yes, absolutely. Um, it, came, it just came down to... It just came down to the situation over there, right? If he could make a roster or not. And <clears throat> I didn't think that he'd play summer league. I really didn't see that coming. Uh, so it took a little longer, but uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have approached it. Even though he's a big name, he has big sh uh, shoes to fill. And Thomas Walkup was not just a tremendous player. He, he set the example by his leadership uh, on the court and of the court. Can you compare, since you know Emmanuel pretty well too from, from Utah, can you compare what kind of leaders they are? I believe they are pretty different players, play pretty different personalities first and foremost. Can you compare what kind of leadership uh, did you like the most about Tom? What did you like about, uh, about him the most? And what kind of leader Emmanuel can become for this team? Yeah, I, I, you are 100% right. They are re actually, they're not comparable. Like the players and stylistically, they're not comparable, and also personality-wise, they're not comparable. Um, so <laughs> it, it it really uh, and also I think the comparison doesn't uh, like I don't want to harp on the comparison because it's um, it, it's really it's a new player, it's a new look, you know, it's Emmanuel Mourier. and Emmanuel Moody is um, is a mm, is a really good player with a with a interesting past, uh, which, um, you know, can, uh, if he, if he gets adjusted to the European game, I think the situation can be very good for him and very good for us. And, uh, and that's really it. Uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, far away from putting pressure on him because the pressure that gets put on him, uh, I don't think helps him, you know, it's, uh, the pressure on him will be big enough just because of the name and the media and I'm not criticizing you, it's your job, right? It's like, but at the end of the day, what Emmanuel needs is peace and quietness and work and, 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 and basketball and that's it. You know, I think in the past, uh, in his basketball and professional career, he's got, he's had a lot of um, hype and a lot of um, talk uh, and I think it's important for him to work the game and, 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 you know, play the game and actually kind of be taken away out of the limelight a little bit, as difficult as it is. Watching you guys play the last season in EuroLeague, it seemed like backcourt players were very important uh, to your system. You had an amazing offensive threat like Marius Grigonis all around the star, I would say, uh, Tom Walkup. And now we have Emmanuel, Yanis, uh, Mantas, for example, as a backup. What these new tools, I would say, will bring uh, to you uh, as the coach? Um, yeah, you know, uh, first of all, you're absolutely right. I mean, but uh, the backcourt players are important for everybody in basketball, right? I, I think the, we saw it with uh, the basketball just starts in the hands of the guards. It's what it is, you know, it's it's not, it's a permit oriented game and like, you know, you can, uh, and so it's, it's just important. I think it's important to have some uh, guys on the floor can run pick and rolls, especially wing wings who can run pick and rolls. I think that's where Marius and Rokas were really good, and uh, I and Giannis is Giannis at the wing is really good there, and then Lucas um, at the wing as well <coughs> with you know Emmanuel and with Mantas at the one. Lucas should be at the two. This was one big thought for us to just release him of like um, point guard responsibilities. And, um, but I mean, you need multiple ball handlers and uh, you know, those four guys uh, will handle the ball a lot and run a lot of pick and rolls. In my opinion, one of your uh, best strengths uh, as the head coach is the way you recruit players. Uh, for example, I've heard that uh, your connection with Emmanuel was very important in convincing him to come to Europe, particularly to Jalgiris. 
Josh, Josh Nebo was amazed the way you prepared for the interview, how, do you, how you bring all these uh, assistant coaches, what kind of analysis you made. Neil Giffey also mentioned it, all the other players, they were more uh, examples. Who set you an example of the way how to recruit the, the players? How did you learn, you know, that kind of, uh, about the importance of that kind of attention for recruiting? Oh, you know, it's, uh, it's something that uh, I think in the NBA they do really well and totally advanced in the NBA, just the, uh, especially the draft process, right, which I was always involved in and really is a phenomenal, fun thing. And uh, in the draft process, you know, the, the Utah Jazz, we interviewed like, we interviewed so many people, like I think, like again, like for 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 two draft picks we interviewed like easily 70 to 80 people and uh and then didn't only interview them but also brought like 70 people in for draft workouts right of course this was always in connection with the g league team so me as a g league head coach running the draft workouts i was very interested in getting guys in who you know are end of the draft or like not getting drafted and then like being interesting for the g league so the, that process uh, is super interesting. I love the way the jazz ran that stuff, and uh, it's um, it's very professionally run due to the fact that the staffing is just much bigger, right? Like you've got front offices and you've got professional scouts, and um, you've got a bigger volume of money for that area. I want to say, right? So uh, to answer your question, that's where. Mm. I kind of got in touch with the technique. You're also known as a good researcher, as a guy who makes a good research. And I was thinking, uh, what kind of made, what kind of research, what kind of self-analysis you made after your first EuroLeague uh, rookie experience? Because I believe you try to analyze yourself. What did you like? What you didn't like about yourself? Um, I, actually. Um, I liked uh, quite a lot, um, and I don't mean this in a dumb way. But I, I, I tend to be, I tend to be far too critical of myself, and far too critical of myself. Or I don't want to say far too critical because that's just part of the game and part of who I am. But at the same time, like uh, just being too critical of oneself. Uh, is perhaps not healthy either, you know, because I thought last season was really successful, like, like really successful, you know, 50% Euroleague, um, 50% Euroleague wins is, I thought was pretty phenomenal. And like the way we play the LKL was with three losses overall was, was really good. And the way we finish it off. And so for the fact that we actually put some good stuff together, uh, uh, often I was not happy. And so far, <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, convince myself, um, uh, you know, to be a little bit more happy, you know. <laughs> but uh, going into detail, I mean, you know, I, I the bigger, the biggest thing uh, to me is that you learn. I learned a lot last year during the season, and it was all on the fly, and I mean, it will continue. Um, and it's really. I want to say last season it was a lot of, I'll give you an example, like post defense, you know, like even though post up play is not as efficient and teams go away from it, still is very spread in Europe. And despite the fact that you perhaps don't really score on the block continuously, well, you you put fouls on people, right? Especially three-man post-ups. So what I'm saying is, whether you believe in posting or not, you've got to guard it. You know. So just as an example, yeah. you know. So that kind of took uh, that kind of took um, uh, took a while last season to figure out. Okay, how do we actually do this? How do we do that? And then in the summer, think about it and do it better this year. Hopefully, what kind of off-court lessons? Did you take from that experience? Um, off court lessons, you know what? Um, nothing spectacular. I know this sounds crazy, but nothing spectacular because one of my biggest strengths last year was two things handling the schedule, 
because I knew the schedule and I knew how to handle the schedule, energy-wise, mentally-wise, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, because I knew tight schedules. And uh, the other thing that was not so shocking, although there was so much learning on the fly, and like, listen, like if you coach a Euroleague team and uh, and you've never been a head coach in Europe, like that's a pretty big step. Uh, and I know people like, you know, but the thing is, I had already faced a lot of stuff in the G League. Like, because if you go from being an assistant coach in Europe to being a head coach in a completely different game, and you've never been a head coach on the pro level, and you handle that, and there was a lot to handle there, a lot, and a lot to learn on the fly. The one thing I knew, despite the fact that everything was, a lot of stuff was happening, I knew I had already been in that situation. You know, so I, I knew that I could adjust. So it was that inner peace gave me a little bit of strength, you know. So that's why I answer your question with, actually, it wasn't like I learned so much about myself. You know what I mean? It was really more basketball. I'm just thinking if it's fair to think and fair to expect that we can see some new things uh, in your daily routine in terms of, you know, after you had this yearly group experience, uh, you kind of, you know, adjusted to the your league. You know how things are run in LKL, for example. How can you, uh, you know, work in this uh, schedule? For just an example, there were some, you know, eyebrows raised uh, how you handle LKL rotations, how you handle some specific young players like uh, Marek uh, Blažević. I was thinking if you, you know, got into that comfort zone where you can take some new risks, some new things, uh, which you could be willing to do the next season could be, but really depends on how the game, how how we do. You know, in all honesty, because you know the funny thing is, like at the end of the day, we were so over prepared. Like no, no, we were prepared. That's why we lost three games in the entire season. You know, like just, like that's not a lot of games to lose. You know, and you know the reality of it is this is important for me because everybody says. Uh, the competition, the competition. Well, for the competition in LKL is not easy at all. Like, not easy at all. And I think people don't understand. Like, the top teams are the top teams. They're really well coached. And everybody wants to beat you. And you always come off a two, off a, off a, off a, like, tough physical situation, you know. Last year with 14 guys, no EuroLeague team played, had 14 guys only. This year, probably with even less, um, is not easy. And if, although you say, well, you can rest, you can rest. Well, you know what? If I'm the first guy to lose seven games till Christmas, oh, well, I lose my job. So, you know what? I rather win the games. And uh, to Malik, I love Malik with all the passion. And that's why he's the third big this year. And then, you know, and, 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 and last year, just also like how, like that was the interesting thing to me. Um, the interesting thing to me was like the questions about Malik uh -huh. was really interesting to me. Like I, because like he was a fourth center on the team. Like which coach in the world can play fourth? Like it doesn't work. Just the math of it doesn't work, you know? So it's like, um, you know, but I think he's earned the spot now and I'm happy for him. This, the Mark example uh, is probably another learning experience about European and especially Lithuanian basketball cult culture, right? It seems funny, but at the same time, it's another cultural thing of Lithuanian basketball. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. we are hyped about young players and stuff like that. Yes, and you know, the funny thing to me was the interesting part to me is, like, the interesting part was the Mark was so interesting and I think also the questions about Mark were so often and I didn't quite get it, because of course I played Rokas so much, mm. right? I mean, I, I raised Rokas minutes for 15 minutes plus, right? I don't know when the last, you know what I mean? Like yeah, basically I came in and played Rokas Jokobaitis. Nobody thought he would play. Um, and I think because of that, probably the whole Malik thing came, I would assume. Is it, is it only us Lithuanians who are, you know, as, is, as I mentioned, you gave Rokas enough minutes, but are we only, you know, 
that kind of hungry nation, if you give us this, we want something more. We want this right now, or it's like common thing in Austria and Germany or no, G League. And I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's the pride in the game in this country, which is, to me, really uh, uh, phenomenal. And I don't say it because I say it for media or anything. Uh, it's a little bit like. The NBA for Europeans is weird and it was super weird for me to understand. And you can only understand when you're in it for a while, whether you like or not. And in Lithuania, I think it's the same. Everybody knows Lithuania is crazy for basketball, but you can only understand when you're in it. So many Lithuanian players, right? Out of a country with three million people, right? So many Lithuanian players, unbelievable. So much media coverage, so much knowledgeable media co co coverage, right? In such a small country is phenomenal. And one part of it is the pride in it, right? And the pride in, and that's the strength of the country. Uh, that's the strength of the basketball, right? And so I don't blame anybody, like by no means, right? But I think you saw how last year oh, the question always came in the beginning. I was like, uh, I was, I wasn't quite sure if I understood something correctly or not. And then later on, I understood. And then unfortunately, it was just like what it was, you know, like, well, like there was nothing else I could have done, you know, and I'm happy that uh, we've got the situation set up for Malik now. Last question, coach. Mm -hmm. uh, Thanks. Three, three games into the preseason, Schalke still couldn't win a game. Okay, it's still the preseason, but as far as I understood, you had a serious, quite serious team meeting. What do you don't like the most about the direction your team is going at the moment, and what do you want to fix the most right now? Um, a lot of things. Uh, that's that's a challenging thing because a lot of things. But um, uh, bottom line is, you said it before. It's been a huge turnaround, like. A, one thing like I have to understand is we've got a really new team uh, that has to find uh, itself in a lot of levels and I think optimism is the main thing here because um, just because you know there is no there is it's it's I'm not saying it's preseason ha 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 you know by no means but I am uh, staying you know I'm positive and right now it's about uh, being positive and having positive outlooks on everything uh, and not um uh not uh, like you know falling into a hole from a mental standpoint now having said that of course you need absolute urgency of course you need absolute uh uh understanding of uh, the process uh having to be better etc 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 right but i want to have the overall optimism going because I, I really believe that's that's really important thanks a lot for your time coach uh, you can watch this conversation and you can follow us on basketnews.com coach told that we are doing a good job so trust trust the coach hey thank you very much